Online game offers insights into epidemics August 21, 2007 The epidemic swept the world. Fortunately, it was only the World of Warcraft, a popular online role-playing game. But that got gotten the attention of real disease experts at Tufts and Rutgers universities. That's because the accidental outbreak that attacked the virtual characters offered a unique opportunity to study how social groups can help spread a disease. In late 2005 the epidemic hit the world of Warcraft, played by millions. It all started with an error. One creature was supposed to infect only a few virtual players with so-called corrupted blood. But some of the nastiest virtual inhabitants exploited a flaw and spread the disease to unsuspecting masses. The virtual quarantines game designers tried to impose didn't work, in part because the virtual people didn't follow them, and so entire virtual cities were virtually destroyed. Conservationists have long debated whether the koala should go on the Australian National Threatened Species List. While the koala is clearly in trouble in some parts of the country, in Queensland, for example, high numbers are afflicted by disease, in other parts such as Victoria and South Australia the problem is not that koala populations are falling, but that they have grown to the point where they are almost too numerous. For a species to be classed as vulnerable, its population must have decreased by more than 30% over the last three generations or 10 years. The problem is that when such a stipulation is applied to koalas, the Victorian boom offsets the Queensland bust, and the species stays off the list. This has repercussions because northern koalas are different to southern ones. They are smaller, for example, and they contain a genetic variation not represented in the south. For this reason, a split listing has been devised koalas from New South Wales, the ACT and Queensland are now officially vulnerable, those from Victoria and South Australia are not considered threatened. A recent study reveals that the ability to walk quickly in old age is an indicator of a long life. The report examined results from recent research. The participants in the research were tested on a regular basis over an extended period of time. The researchers focused on the relationship between walking speed in the post-65 age group and longevity. They concluded that there was a direct correlation between walking speed and lifespan. A key researcher gave the explanation that this link exists because walking involves the use of many bodily functions working in unison. The heart, lungs, skeletal system, joints, muscles, nerves and brain have to work together in order to ensure a consistent speed. Damage to any of these systems may mean a much slower walking speed which could signal medical problems. One of the questions we need to ask ourselves is, how much of the news is biased? Can we recognize bias? The fact is, despite the journalistic ideal of objectivity, every news story is influenced by the attitudes and background of its interviewers, writers, journalists, photographers and editors. That is not to say that all bias is deliberate, but it does exist. So how can we, as readers or viewers, determine bias? Well, in the case of newspapers, it manifests itself in a number of ways, such as what events are selected for inclusion or omission. The placement of the article, meaning its proximity to the front or back pages, is significant. The use of headlines, photographs and language are further examples.
Lyrebirds, a common bird in rainforest areas of Australia, have an incredible repertoire of sounds that they are able to mimic from their environment, including over 20 other bird calls as well as sophisticated mechanical sounds. They have been known to replicate the sounds of chainsaws and pneumatic drills. The male lyrebird sings a medley of mimicry to impress females, and the more detailed and varied his repertoire is, the more interesting it seems to potential mates. Like females of other bird species, female lyrebirds do not take place in the imitating, but simply judge the competing male's symphonies. Once learned, it seems a lyrebird rarely forgets a call, and the sounds are passed down through the generations. There are some lyrebirds in Victoria, Australia, that still recreate the sounds of axes, saws and old-fashioned cameras which have not been used in the area for years. For Professor David Phoenix, the Dean of the Faculty of Science and Technology, the return of single honors chemistry is a master of credibility and pride. If you say you're a science faculty, you have to have all the core sciences, and this course will mean we attract a new supply of potential masters and Ph.D. students in chemistry, but he thinks that an attraction for students will be a teaching approach that differs significantly from his days as an undergraduate. This takes real-life issues as the starting point of lectures and modules, such as how drugs are made, or the science behind green issues. Out of this study, he says, students will be exposed to exactly the same core chemistry, unchanged over decades, but they will be doing it in a way that is more engaging and more likely to lead to more fundamental learning. It is an approach that symbolizes chemistry's recent success story, moving with the times, while holding fast to the subject's essential role as a building block of science and technological advance. While past research has found higher intelligence scores among breastfed babies, what is so significant about this study is the researchers were able to collect more complete information on breastfeeding duration and also followed for a longer period. And, by using a population-based birth cohort, the breastfeeding practices had no association with income level. Most of the evidence of higher intelligence test scores among breastfed babies comes from high-income countries, where middle-class and higher-class mothers are more likely to breastfeed their babies than lower-income mothers. Certainly in the United States, breastfeeding rates reflect this trend. The increased funding will go to nutrition programs including school breakfast and lunch and more. First Lady Michelle Obama issued a supportive statement upon receiving the news of the passage of the bill that could impact the Let's Move campaigns that aims to end childhood obesity within a generation. I congratulate Chairman Miller and the House Education and Labor Committee on the successful, bipartisan passage of a child nutrition reauthorization bill out of the committee today. This important legislation will combat hunger and provide millions of school children with access to healthier meals, a critical step in the battle against childhood obesity. In the statement, she urged the House and Senate for a further legislative action. The president looks forward to signing a final bill this year so that we can make significant progress in improving the nutrition and health of children across our nation. Chemicals used to control weeds and crops such as corn and soybeans may sometimes run off farmland and enter surface water bodies such as lakes and streams. 
If a surface water body that is used as a drinking water supply receives excess amounts of these herbicides, then the municipal water treatment plant must filter them out in order for the water to be safe to drink. This added filtration process can be expensive. Farmers can help control excess herbicides in runoff by choosing chemicals that bind with soil more readily, are less toxic, or degrade more quickly. Additionally, selecting the best tillage practice can help minimize herbicide pollution. To understand how a coffee nap might work, we need to look at how the body processes caffeine. When you drink a coffee, the caffeine stays in the stomach for a while before moving to the small intestine. It is from here that caffeine is absorbed and distributed throughout the body. This process, from drinking to absorption, takes 45 minutes. Although caffeine is broken down in the liver, Half of it remains in the blood for 4 to 5 hours after drinking a moderate amount, equivalent to 2 large cups of brewed coffee. It takes more time to eliminate greater amounts of caffeine from the body. It is the assertion of this article that students who use visual art as a pre-writing stimulus are composing their ideas both in images and in words. The result of the art creation process allows students the distance to elaborate, add details, and create more coherent text. The process of writing is more than putting words on a piece of paper. Effective authors are able to create imagery and to communicate ideas using well-chosen words, phrases, and text structures. Emergent writers struggle with the mechanics of the writing process, i.e., fine motor control for printing legibly, recall of spelling patterns, and the use of syntax and grammar rules. As a result, texts written by young writers tend to be simplistic and formulaic. The artwork facilitates the writing process, resulting in a text that is richer in sensory detail and more intricate than the more traditional writing first crayon drawing second approach. What can computer science tell us about what biological systems do and how they do it? Can these chemical information processing functions be replicated in digital computing? Systems. What are the implications of developments in computer science and understanding the nature of causality? Aaron Sloman, author of Computer Revolution and Philosophy delves into the world of connections between ideas developed in computer science, biology and philosophy, providing new insights into some fundamental questions about the nature of consciousness and free will. Three degrees does not sound like much, but it represents a rise in temperature compatible with the global heating that occurred between the last ice age, some 15,000 years ago, and the warmth of the 18th century. When Earth was cold, giant glaciers sometimes extended from the polar regions as far south as St. Louis in the U.S. and the Alps in Europe. Later this century, when it is three degree, hotter glaciers everywhere will be melting in a climate of often unbearable heat and drought punctuated with storms and floods. The consequences for humanity could be truly horrific if we fail to act swiftly. The full impact of global heating could cull us along with vast populations of the plant and animals with whom we share Earth. 
In a worst-case scenario, there might, in the 22nd century, be only a remnant of humanity, eking out a diminished existence in the polar regions and the few remaining oases left on a hot and arid earth.